let's pick up where we left off last time. The, la <coughs> the last thing we did in the previous lecture was calculation of the noise uh, temperature for like a cascading set of devices. We had something very similar to this where this is a typical uh, front end of the receiver with the antenna, LNA, possibly the cable before the LNA. Then you have a band selection filter, mixer, channel selection filter, IF amplifier, and then it goes into demodulating state. Demodulating can be done in analog or it can be done uh, these days more uh, often than not uh, doing digital, uh, digital uh, demodulation there. A lot of times, uh, <coughs> so, so when you take something like this and you translate that into equations, you end up that the noise power at this at this output here is going to be sum of all the gains times the times the uh, 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 bandwidth times the Boltzmann's constant times the equivalent uh, noise temperature of the system, and the, and the equivalent noise temperature is whatever comes to the antenna, whatever is generated in the cylinder, and then the rest of it as well, where you have the stage. Gain scaling each one of the temperature or the devices that come after it. So that's the general equation for calculation of the noise temperature. Dominating factors, if your gain of the front end amplifier is large, the dominating factor is whatever comes to the antenna and whatever is the, uh, the noise figure of the, of the front end amplifier. So that's the, <coughs> the procedure. What I've done is and this is included in this PowerPoint, is put all of this in a spreadsheet so that, that you can use it for the problems that you will be solving. Uh, there are two spreadsheets. This one is kind of following the example 41. We did both of these examples, right, last time. We did them manually. But embedded in this, uh, in this, uh, <coughs> in this slide and the next slide are two spreadsheets that kind of repeat these calculations. What you need to do is go through them carefully and verify how the calculations are done, and then you can use it to verify your work in solving problems, just like we did with the rest of it. I'm not going to spend much time here, but you can see that. Alright, so let's uh, <coughs> press on. <coughs> I already kind of talked about uh, the, how the receivers are typically done. Most of the radio receivers deploy something that's called super heterodyne principle. Uh, this just means that uh, you actually separate the, um, the RF and then uh, as, as the end where you transmit and receive from the IF where most of the processing is being done. The reason why we do that is we try to conquer all sorts of frequencies going as high as we can possibly uh, make our equipment work. And as a matter of fact, these days, there's nowhere to go but high because we've kind of saturated almost the entire uh, low end of the spec. But as you go higher, the bandwidth of your, of your transmission becomes smaller and smaller relative to the carrier frequency. And what that does, it makes the design and, and uh, implementation of the high quality components much more expensive. So the way around it is we actually uh, transmit and receive at the proper RF frequencies, but then do the translation of the signal to the lower frequency where all the processing is being done. Most of the time you have a single IF frequency, and this is what is called, uh, what is called a single conversion receiver. And then sometimes if, you're, if your frequency of operation is uh, relatively high, then you actually may have double conversion, where you have double conversion receiver, where you have two IF frequencies. But in all, almost all of the uh, um, RF receivers, you have these three stages, RF stage, IF stage, and basement. And interesting, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that you're familiar with the principle of how this works, and why this mixing brings it down. This is all translated from the filter for the transform. I want to point out two filters here. Front end filter, this is the filter that performs the band selection. It's the one that operates at RF, and therefore that one is a relatively large band. 
it doesn't have to be very selective. Its purpose is to make sure that whatever enters this receiver <coughs> as a whole does not have a power that will make, that will saturate the components. There is really one more filter that's part of the uh, LNA and uh, that sits that sits right after the antenna that kind of roughly limits the band that you're working on. The one that is important from from what we're doing here is this IF filter or channel selection filter. This is the filter that determines the noise bandwidth of your receiver. That's the filter that actually cuts everything out except the channel that you're listening to. Now, this filter has to be highly selective. For example, if you're, trying, if you're receiving uh, 40 megahertz in the C band, then the filter has a 40 megahertz band. As a matter of fact, it's slightly smaller, but it's very selective. It can be very selective because it's working on IF frequency, so the frequency is much lower. So even though it is selective, its bandwidth relative to the carrier frequency is not extremely small. And then after that, you have the IF amplifier, which is which provides most of the gain. Usually, it's a, it's a adaptive gain, variable gain amplifier which uh, means that if the signal is weak, the gain kind of increases. If the signal is very strong, the gain becomes smaller. So that the, ra the, the dynamic range of the signal here is limited and adequate for whatever comes as a demodulator. That's the common receiver architecture. There's a, uh, there's a, I guess, opposite of super heterodyne reception, and this is a direct conversion reception. What, what that does is you don't have this stage here. Instead, what you do is, uh, when you're doing mixing, you bring the signal all the way to basement. So your mixing frequency is the same as your RF frequency. Now, that's very appealing because you're, you're reducing one processing stage, but it's very hard to do. And uh, and uh, you know there are there are uh, direct conversion architectures, but it's something that is still under under study. How we can actually do that and. You know, if, you, if you look at a little bit of literature, you will find out that there are all sorts of problems related to that particular architecture. So almost all of the receivers that we have today are implementing super heterodynamics. So now we have, if you remember, we are working on a link budget. So we're, we're having two links. We have an uplink and downlink. Downlink is a weaker link. Uplink is the link from the ground station to the satellite. Downlink is the link from the satellite to the ground station on return. Uh, downlink is a weaker one. Why? Because the power that you have on a satellite is, is limited. <coughs> also, the antenna that you have on a satellite is kind of a smaller size, and its ability to focus energy is smaller. And uh, even if you could focus energy, unless you're doing uh, point-to-point -point communication, you're actually covering area. Let's say you cover continental U.S., therefore you're, you cannot really focus. You have to cover this entire area, right? And that limits the amount of power, that, the effective radiating power that you can uh, radiate from the satellite towards the ground. Now, when you, when you do the link budget, as I said earlier, when you start doing these things, it's really no different then balancing your checkbooks. You have to kind of account for all the gains, account for all the losses, and then that's for the most part straightforward. The trickiest part of the balancing of the link budget, just like balancing the checkbook, are those things that you cannot predict, that you don't know what they are. Right? So uh, we protect uh, against those things by leaving some money on account or, or budgeting for some additional uh, additional margin that we call design margin. Uh, so uh, link budget evaluates various design trade-offs. As, as we went through that a uh, couple lecture goes, the fundamental trade-offs that you are uh, juggling here is the data rate, bandwidth, and power. Right? Capacity, uh, bandwidth, and power. And then all of that needs to be uh, you know, juggled at a given reliability and component size, and just all the practical aspects of, of the design. So I tried to kind of make this a little bit streamlined. And you know, the way how I 
propose you do link budgets. Now, if you look at link budgets, they, everybody has their own way of doing it. But I try to kind of say, okay, if you look at a typical link budget, what are the things that you find there? And regardless of how it looks or how it's presented, you're going to find core things. You're going to have something that deals with your trust method, that accounts for all the gains and losses of your trust method. The output of that part of the link budget is going to be your effective radiated power, EIRP. So you're going to work out your, you know, powers, your antenna gain, cable losses, back off, whatever you you do on the receiver, but the output is going to be effective radiated power from this antenna towards this point in space is going to be this much. So that's the first section of the link budget. The second section of the link budget is going to be dealing with the receiver. Here you're going to actually move to the receiver chain and try to calculate what is the receiver sensitivity. And uh, in what we did in RF propagation, we usually move the receiver sensitivity before antenna. Now this is not a, gen not a common practice in satellite because of the variability of the noise temperature. So we kind of still keep it at, at, the, at the output of the antenna. But regardless of what, what you do, you have to have a section of the link budget that deals strictly with receivers, with the objective of that section to determine what is the minimum receive signal power that I need to put, put, provide to that receiver so that it functions properly. And we usually refer to it as receiver sensitivity. <coughs> now, there is a propagation in between uh, transmitter and receiver. By calculating ERP and the receiver sensitivity, you're going to determine what is your path loss budget, how much you can spend on overcoming all the path loss. And uh, that, would, that, would give you, that you would be able to plug into the propagation model of some sort that will try to predict what the actual path loss is that you expect on a given link. Now, every prediction model is going to be able to predict, uh, let's say, uh, part of that loss, and there will be a component that is that is uncertain, kind of where the model is not able to deal with all the uncertainty. In the satellite communications, for example, you're able to, let's say, predict the, the deterministic path of the loss, which is, say, your free space, but then whether what is in between in terms of weather, whether it's raining, whether there are clouds, whether you know all these variabilities will will add that random component at the end of your path loss that you have to quantify. And based on the statistical properties, determine what type of the margin you need to deploy in your system, so that under adverse conditions of that of that uh, additional component of your path loss, your still system still functions. Typically, satellite systems are designed for a fixed modulation scheme, floating in modulation scheme. In other words, you kind of design them so for the worst case. You say, I'm going to use this bandwidth this type of modulation, and I want to build enough margins so that I have a reliability of, let's say, 99.999% of the time. Now, if you think about it from what we know from terrestrial communication, that's a suboptimal way of doing things. Why? Because what you're doing is you're designing for the worst case, worst case that happens just a fraction of the percent. Knowing what we know about Shannon's capacity formula, that means that 99.999% of the time you're over design and you have great reliability but your throughput is suffering there because you could have got more throughput if you knew that the link is doing this good. So traditionally satellite system as I said were, were designed for the worst case as of recently we're actually uh, seeing application of adaptive modulation encoding on the sat satellite links. What that means is that there's a feedback going on between transmission and reception side where the reception side informs the transmitter about the ch channel st the state conditions saying, oh, I'm seeing this kind of signal to noise ratio or whatever is the equivalent metric that is used. Based on the feedback, the transmitter can determine which one out of possi many possibilities uh, for modulation encoding it can use. So in a good channel conditions, let's say, Great, uh, great sky with no rain or whatever is the impairment in between. You can actually increase your data rate, and then if if you're if you're suffering on a, on a path loss, then you drop down the data rate and still maintain the connectivity. 
that's something that you see as of re recently. You see right away that this has to have, you know, be, go hand in hand with your regenerative uh, uh, satellite satellites because you know you have to actually be able to switch. Well, it doesn't have to be. You can actually switch it on on the ground, but but it needs to have some sort of uh, ability of changing those on the fly based on the feed. Is there another antenna system purely for that? Or no, it has nothing. Antenna system is linked to the frequency, right? Yeah. Antenna per se does not care about your modulation encoding. You know, from well, I figured there's like one system that does the uh, link, and then another system that does this adapted and you know, saying, okay, your your link is this, or is it writing on the same? Same, it's the same antenna system. Let me, okay. let me just uh, I'll just a little bit in. Let me just uh, yeah. or kind of sketch that. Let's say, let's say this is. Let me just do this. Let's say this is your situation. Not to get too off topic. Not to get too off topic. No, it's 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 important because a lot of these things is what if you are coming things and if you end up being a uh, part of, the, of, of this workforce, you're going to be actually working on these particular things. Because right? yeah, this is like a separate system for like telemetry and that kind of stuff? Yes, you so can use it. Yeah, so correct. Maybe if figured it would be tied into that. Uh, correct. The, 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 you're talking about how does the signaling get delivered, right? Well, yeah. the, it can be delivered uh, through, through the telemetry. It doesn't have to be. However you get it delivered, if it's the two-way link, it may have the signaling embedded in it. Well, let me illustrate the principle. Let's say this is this is the link, right? And let's say uh, in a clear uh, clear day, the signal to noise ratio here is I don't know. Let's say 15 dB, right? So remember our our uh, capacity formula that says that your C uh, that your R uh, B over bandwidth is log base 2 of 1 plus signal to noise ratio. So RB is your, this B is fixed. This is the bandwidth that you're using. Signal to noise ratio is what you're experiencing on a given link, aggregate signal to noise ratio. So as this changes, you can see that your, that your uh, uh, spectral efficiency uh, uh, limit, because this is the limit, right? this is the channel limit, changes as well. If your if your signal to noise ratio goes up, you can potentially uh, use the use. Um, so let's say this is time, and now I, I plot this R B over B over time. As your signal to noise ratio is good, let's say this is a clear day, this is the variability of your of your pressure. Then it starts raining, so you end up with this, and then it's sunny again. Right? If you are designing your system. Uh, for the worst case scenario, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to set my spectral efficiency to be this, right? And let's say this is, I don't know, one bit per hertz, right? Or let's say two bit or whatever is the threshold that you're setting. That means majority of the time you have, you're vastly exceeding what is needed to operate this link. So what the systems do is through some sort of feedback, Kind of change the modulation encoding scheme to accommodate for that, and then when your signal to noise ratio is great, you end up having a higher spectral efficiency. Switching the modulation, going from let's say QPSK to uh, the 16 QAM or, or or higher, and then when it, your signal to noise ratio suffers, you go back down to a lower modulation scheme. How do you get this this signaling back and forth that that this kind of system design is you how you gonna do it however you, you can, but uh, the principle is, is this one. Now, um, in, uh, in uh, terrestrial systems, we do this all the time. All of your 3G, 4G phones, you, you know, do this many times a second. But in satellite, we actually have a channel that does not vary too fast. So, you know, these, these variations happen at a much lower pace, therefore, you know, you can can always uh, look happen at much slower pace. All right. So what we're going to do today and, 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 and the next time, we're going to look at the first 
second and third, right? Now, the part four, which is a link reliability and marching calculation, is a separate theory of its own. And I think that's what we're going to address after when we're done with it. So at this point, I'm just going to give, give you a number and say, hey, let's assume this for a link margin. Where did that come from? We don't know at this point. But as you will see later, there are some uh, ITU recommendations that I'm going to cover and give you the, uh, give you the, the actual documents that uh, go at great length how this link reliability is calculated. Because this is one of the most important parts of the design. I mean, if you, if you over-design, then you, you're not making as much money as you can. But if you're under design, then you have a lot of outage, so your customers are, your customers are happy. So let's uh, just go through individual sections of the budget, and then, and then what, uh, what I will give you at the end is the spreadsheet that, uh, that kind of has this as a template in which you punch the numbers and get uh, all of these calculations done. But uh, still, you know, I would like you to be able to verify and then use these kind of spreadsheets and tools that I provide to you with uh, understanding. I'm just helping you put them together. But, you know, I hope that as a result of this, you, you're able to put them together yourself as well. Now, uh, we're now on a downlink. So the first thing that we deal with is the transmission side. And then we have your transponder out to power. This is the power amplifier that you have on the transponder. And that power amplifier is ready. Let's say this power amplifier, I don't know, it's, it's uh, 50 watt uh, uh, output power. Now, when you say that, this is a, this is a, this is the power that uh, uh, that depends how it's specified. But a lot of times, it's the peak power, the power that uh, the highest power that the transponder can uh, uh, can send. Now, depending on the actual modulation scheme. Your waveform that you're sending can have uh, what is referred to as different peak to average power ratio. In other words, depending on what symbol you're tra transmitting, you know the, the the transmit power may be higher or lower. There are two types of modulation schemes. One that uh, that have symbols of a different power, and ones that have symbols are the same. I don't have a maybe one of you would have the pre marker up there. Yeah but it's it's, it's almost invisible. Check the channel is there. So uh, just just for for those of you who are who are uh, good at uh, digital communication. You know that we usually represent our symbols in, uh, in these constellation diagrams, right? Where the, each point in this tells you how much of a sine and a cosine we need to mix uh, to create a particular symbol. There are modulation schemes for which all the symbols are residing on the same circle. What does that mean? That means that there, regardless of what the symbol is, your power is the same. And these are the modulation schemes with a low, very low peak to average power ratio. If you use QPSK, if you use BPSK, or if you use any of the PSK modulation schemes, your average power stays the same. <coughs> but there are other modulation schemes where you're using you know, points that are like this, right? I'm kind of showing. See where the distance of the point from the from the origins vary depending on what the symbol you are you are transmitting, and in this case, your your power varies from symbol to symbol. So if you if you plot your instantaneous power, it might look somewhat uh, as a square of this, or it may vary over time. So if I have a time. Let's say this is my power over time, depending on what symbol you I use. Now there is an average power, and there is a, your peak power. And then 10 log of P peak 
over P average is referred to as P to average power ratio. And that's a quantity that is attached to a given weight, to a given modulation type. So if you say, okay, I have this particular modulation type, the modulation type comes with this, uh, with a particular peak to average power ratio. Peak to average power ratio is important here because if, if you're operating power amplifier, you have, to make, you have to make sure that this power amplifier operates uh, in a linear region of its gain for all the symbols that you're transmitting. So that means that you know, it has to be linear for the peak and it has to be linear for the, the symbol that is of the smallest energy, smallest power. Right? As a result of that, your average power is, has to be a certain number of dBs below the peak capability of the power amplifier. So the power amplifier has, let's say, uh, operates uh, at a maximum power of 100 watts and your peak to average power ratio is 10 dB, that means your average power needs to be 10 watts. It's, you need to back off 10 dB so that, so that when you're transmitting the signals with the highest power, you're not saturating your amplifier and causing all sorts of nonlinear distortion that, uh, that spectral regrowth and corrupting of the adjacent bands and, and all sorts of uh, products. Now, this, this uh, is particularly, uh, uh, becomes particularly important when uh, for some of the recent waveforms, like uh, one of the uh, recently, uh, the satellites have been using CDMA waveforms uh, and OFDM waveforms, which are both known to be with a relative high peak to average power ratio, because both of them have noise-like characteristics. And noise-like means that, you know, that uh, uh, they kind of approach Gaussian amplitude, right, which is a very peak. The peak to average power, uh, the ratio uh, characteristic of a given waveform is uh, specified through these, what, what, these types of curves, which are called CCDF curves, or complement of uh, CDF. Uh, cumulative distribution function. On the x-axis here, you see you put the threshold above the average, and in the y-axis you put the probability of exceeding this threshold. So if I look at, for example, this waveform here, I can say well, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's, let's say, 1.5 dB per, per division. If I say, what is the uh, probability of exceeding uh, of your signal being 3 dB above the average, then you go two thresholds and you read here 10% of the signal is 3 dB above the average. Now if you go uh, on 3, 6, 9, so you see about 0.1% of the signal is 9 dB above the average. Now what we do is we somehow decide what we're going to do with, because uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of times this kind of goes, uh, and you have to make uh, your engineering trade-off, you have to decide what percentage you're going to protect. So if you say I'm going to protect 0.1% of my signal, I'm going to make sure that that the 99.9% uh, 99 of the range is accommodated, then you pick 0.1, and then you read here what is the threshold that is being exceeded, and then you set your back-off to be at that threshold. So if I were to say protect 0.1, that means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9 dBs is the dynamic range of my signal that I need to protect, and my back off needs to be 9 dB. So I'm going to be operating at the average power, which is 9 dB below the maximum. So that means my 99.9 .9 percentage variations of my signal power would be within the range of the power up. 0.1% it will be exceeding. And I hope that uh, that does not cause major major problems. The the problems that uh, may result from that, if you start clipping, then what that does, it it causes what is called spectrum regrowth. It, you know, when you remember when you start clipping sinusoidal, you start having all of these frequencies that are appearing on outside, and that means that your 
signal is now not confined in the bandwidth that you have for the signal, but starts bleeding into the adjacent band. That's why most of the most of the transmissions are before it goes to the antenna. There's a there's a filter that uh, that uh, is there to reject the out of band emission. So uh, we're not going to spend much time here in most of the problems that you're going to be dealing with. I'm going to be telling you what the back off is, or there will be you know even back off. But be aware that that thing exists, and what we try to do in a lot of satellite systems is select a waveform that has a low peak to average power ratio, which because that has a distinct link budget advantage. Right? You can operate your your power amplifier closer to its maximum point because your back off is uh, small. Now, once you know the back off, your, uh, your ERP, effective isotropic radiating power, is going to be whatever is the conductive power, the power that you deliver to the antenna, that you're capable of delivering to the antenna terminals. This is the maximum power. The gain of the antenna minus the back off, and then minus all the, uh, the losses that you have in the cable and, uh, and uh, antenna itself. Now antenna, if you look at its beam, it, uh, it is not the same everywhere, right? You have the center of the beam, which is the highest gain, and then as you move to the outskirts, then your beam uh, is going towards lower and lower uh, uh, effective radiant power. What we usually do the link budget is, we do the link budget for the, for the points that are on the outskirts, right? Because they're having the smallest smallest gain. You've seen uh, in that video that, uh, and, and also when you when you show the footprint, typically what we do is let's say this is this is some sort of map. Let's say this is uh, I guess map of the United States, and. Uh, uh, so you would point in a certain location and you end up with these contour plots which are telling you what is the ERP at the given direction. So for example here, it would say this is 53 BBM and this is maybe 52 contour and this is 51 contour and so on. Right? So this tells you how is the ERP towards particular direction on the ground. And then if your receiver is, let's say, at this point, then you know that it is in a, inside a 51 dBm contour, so you do the budget for that, uh, for that contour. So that's uh, transmitter sign. So uh, propagation losses, there are parts of the propagation losses which are uh, deterministic and the first one that we start is the free space path loss that's the one that is easily calculated it, uh, it is the good chunk of the loss that uh, we can accommodate in addition to that you have atmospheric losses that are kind of coming from all the variability that exists in the atmosphere and uh, they affect the propagation uh, uh, at this, uh, more or less depending on what is the frequency band that you use for a transmission. And then you have all sorts of losses that are, that are, uh, that are kind of component losses, right? Uh, you know, whether your antennas are aligned, whether you have, uh, you know, uh, geographical component parameters and so on. Uh, as I said, traditionally satellites are designed for the worst case, but, uh, you know, if you have adaptivity, then you have a little bit more flexibility. And this is a separate section that we're going to be dealing right after we finish the in much. And then when you look at the receiver side, this is what you have on the receiver side. You have your antenna gain. It's a, it's a, it's function of efficiency and the antenna's physical side. In a, in a previous uh, chapter, we kind of derived and, and showed some of these equations, how you calculate the uh, antenna gain or estimate the antenna gain. Now again, uh, uh, these are the estimates, and then in, in any particular scenario, you're going to be dealing with the actual antenna. So you can say, okay, you don't have to guess by the size of the antenna. Then you have a system noise temperature that you have to calculate. 
in every new budget, you are ultimately working against the noise, if you're lucky, because a lot of times you have interference. But the noise always provides the limit of every communication. And uh, this is determined by using uh, the methodology we went through last time, uh, prim primarily by the receiver front end. Based on uh, uh, the system noise temperature uh, and the type of the modulation scheme that you use, you're actually uh, able to derive minimum required receiver power for the proper operation of that receiver. This is what this whole thing, this sentence we refer to as receiver sensitivity. So what is the receiver sensitivity? If I say receiver sensitivity minus, minus 105 dBm, what that means is this is the minimum power that I need to provide to the receiver so that I can demodulate the signal with a sufficient quality of service. Um, it, it is determined, I guess, from the noise power and the required signal to noise ratio. Why is this important here? Because the receiver sensitivity in the context here can be changing as a function of what is the, the, the noise power that you have. And, and, and uh, depending on what you're looking at, you know, the noise power may change. Even though your, uh, your modulation type doesn't change, you know, your, your uh, signal power requirement may change depending on what is the amount of the noise that, uh, that is entered in the front end. And then required signal to noise ratio is uh, what uh, comes straight from the uh, type of the modulation encoding that you're using. And uh, that, that is a part of the, uh, I guess, the, the DSP design. But uh, ultimately, it boils down to the Shannon's formula. We know that the signal-to-noise ratio has to be larger than this minimum signal-to-noise ratio for a given spectral efficiency. If I know the bandwidth and I know the data rate, that I need to provide to the bandwidth. This is the minimum signal-to-noise ratio that I have. In practice, we have signal-to-noise ratio usually given in dB as this minimum one plus some value in dB. And we speak about that value in dB as an implementation margin. So you can hear people frequently say, oh, this system works 2 dB over Shannon's lip. What that means is you would you take the spectral efficiency of the system, in other words, it's, it's the data rate relative to its bandwidth, you take 10 log 10 of that, 2 to that minus 1, this gives you the Shannon limit. This is the best the system could do, and then you're a certain number of PVs off, right? You, you're, because you're not operating on the Shannon's limit. And that's your implementation margin. And implementation margin is directly dictated by the type of the coding how how if, if, how efficient how I guess simple or how efficient you want your system to be, you know. In, in these days, we have uh, developed uh, we have developed uh, error control coding uh, that allows us to to make this implementation margin very very small. You can use turbo codes or, or even high end convolutional codes to make this implementation margin relatively small. But then it introduces complexity and also introduces the delay in the process. And so it's kind of trade off there as well. So based on all of these things, what you have here is, uh, is uh, an example of a link budget. Let me go through it. It's, it's the way how it works is, you know, you can double click here and it will open it. But also there's a spreadsheet that, uh, that is attached how to make it bigger. Can you see it? And uh, I, I don't think so, right? It's too, too small. So let me do this. Zoom one. How about if I open the actual Excel? Then the way how, how this is done is I kind of follow this methodology that I just uh, talked about where uh, we are now in the downlink. So here is how you walk through this part. You have your transponder, transmitter, where you specify your transmit power, your backhaul, your you know uh, uh, the the losses based on the antenna pattern. If you're in the mean, here I'm designing for a 3 dB 
then beam with points. So the outskirts of the antenna. Antenna again, the result of this is your ERP. Now you have your propagation losses where I specify the path length, the frequency, atmospheric losses, design margin, and total environmental losses. Now, uh, atmospheric losses and design margin are just numbers that we enter now. Later on I'll show you how you calculate these. And then here I have the earth station where you where you enter the antenna gain, the system noise temperature, G over T for uh, uh, for uh, for the receiver, noise bandwidth, required C to N, and this calculates the receiver sensitivity. And based on this you uh, in, the, in the last section here you get your maximum allowed path loss, which is your ERP minus the receiver sensitivity. This is a budgeted path loss. This is how much you, your system can accommodate. And then you have your access. And in this case, my system is not meeting the budget requirements because my, my path loss that comes from this budget is larger than maximum allowed path loss. So I would need to change some of the parameters to close the link. Uh, and uh, there are some additional calculations here that uh, you know, relate the antenna size, antenna efficiency, and so on. So you actually punch in the numbers here and it will calculate it. I think the, the, let me just double check. Yeah, I, I usually use two colors. Is that antenna 60 square meters? Antenna size. Yeah. Yeah, so what is the, let, let's see here. This is a huge antenna. This is the antenna that has a nine meter diameter, right? I don't know why I was, this is where I, I've got this from somewhere, so I don't know what I was doing at the time. Right? What is the frequency? It's, it's, four, it's a, it's a C-band, so it's, it's a huge, huge dish of the ground. So, so this would, uh, you know, what I would like you to do is go through this spreadsheet, make sure that you are kind of follow how it works, and then use it in problems. Like this. there's going to be a whole bunch of problems that uh, we're going to be doing in preparation for the for our next next test. I wonder if I have anything else on this presentation. Now. So let me see if I have any problems that come along with this. All right, so let me go through a simple examples to show some of these calculations. Consider a receiver with equivalent system temperature Ts is equal to 150 K. So that's the temperature as I said dictated by the RF chain in the receiver. The receiver is connected to the antenna with a waveguide having a loss. So uh, I guess we intended as, as a LS symbol. So let me just write it as a waveguide. Zero point five dB, and the physical temperature. So this is the physical is uh, two hundred and seventy Kelvin. Used waveform that requires a bandwidth. So your equivalent bandwidth is twenty seven megahertz, and the signal to noise ratio required is 9.5 dB. Calculate RX sensitivity if the temperature of the sky, so temperature of the antenna is 75 K, 
and it says here calculate the receiver sensitivity. All right, so here's what uh, what we have. We have our antenna, then we have our waveguide that has a certain losses associated as 0.5 dB. And then here is the point at which we calculate Rx sensitivity. And again, what is the Rx sensitivity? It is the signal level that I need to deliver to this particular point for this yeah. receiver. Now here is the receiver. Uh, here. Now, um, let me actually do it. Let me draw this line. We have here your PS and then your PC. And then this is where I define receiver sensitivity. Okay. <coughs> now, what I need to understand here is this receiver sensitivity in dBm or dBw, whatever it is. It's going to be power of the noise in dBW at this point plus the signal to noise ratio required. That's always the case, right? What is this? What what is the? This is the minimum signal level here. Well, it needs to be so many dBs above the noise. The tricky part here is calculating the total noise that is reaching this input to the receiver. Now. What are the noise components? Well, there is a temperature of the antenna here, and there is the system temperature that is kind of equivalent of this receiver here. So the receiver is, this temperature is not affected by this guy, but the antenna temperature is affected by what is seen by the antenna plus the, the physical temperature of this waveguide. Because remember, waveguide, because it has some losses, will change the, the temperature that of the sky, right, to, to uh, more towards the temp physical temperature of the wave. And the larger these losses are, the input temperature here becomes more and more of, uh, of the same as the, as the temperature of the wave, physical temperature of the wave. So let me call this here T, which is the input temperature uh, with uh, coming from all the noise coming from the antenna but taking the waveguide losses into account. And we had the last time that this T in is going to be T antenna times the gain of the waveguide plus 1 over gain of the waveguide minus 1 times the physical temperature of the waveguide. Here is DC gain of the waveguide. I, I say gain under quotation because GC is the number smaller than 1. It's, it's uh, essentially uh, uh, the inverse of the loss. So gain is 10 to, uh, let me just, gain in dB. Minus 0 0.5 dB. In these equations, all of these are linear terms. So your gain in this equation becomes 10 to the uh, minus 0 0.5 divided by 10. And when you calculate this, this is 0 0.89. So what that means is if you're losing half a dB, that means 89% of the signal power reaches the output of the, of the waveguide. But just like it attenuates the signal, the waveguide is also going to attenuate the noise that are coming through the antenna, and it will substitute sort of this noise with the noise generated by the by the waveguide itself. So, and this is the equation that 
uh, kind of specifies this. So T input becomes temperature of the antenna, which is 150 K times 0 0.89 plus so 1 over 0 0.89 minus 1 times the physical temperature of the wavelength itself. And this gives you 109.26 Kelvin. Okay? So <coughs> your receiver sensitivity becomes now at the receiver, right? At the receiver becomes your 10 law of your uh, noise power in watts, right? Divided by one watt plus your signal to noise required, which in our case becomes 10 log of k times t in plus t s times the equivalent bandwidth of the system and plus signal to noise ratio required. And if I substitute the values, this becomes 10 log or 4 times 10 to the minus 21 that happens. That happens because this already includes the temperature, right? So I have to go and work with a K. So it's 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin times this is 109.26 plus the system noise temperature, which is 70. No, one You switched it. Oh, I switched them around. Yeah, the first one is done. Did I switch them? Oh, okay. But in the, the result is okay. Right? Thanks. So. And this is 75. So this becomes plus 75. No. Plus 150. Plus 150, 150 right? 150. And then times 27 times 10 to the 6 hertz. And then plus this uh, 9.5, what's the 9.5 dB? So this gives you minus 120.65 dB. So that's the receiver sensitivity at this point, minus 120.65 dB bar. Now you can move, you know, for the link budget purposes, you can move this sensitivity. If it is minus 120 here, what is it here? Well, if it is minus 120 here, it needs to be at least half a dB above that in this point. Why? Because it's going to lose half a dB going through this wave. So it needs to be minus 120.15 dB at this point. And then if you know your antenna gain, you can move it to this point. Uh, so, okay. right. This is right before the antenna for your calculation of the maximum allowable path loss in a free space. Now that's uh, that's uh, commonly done in microwave system and terrestrial system. You know, satellite guys may or may not do it depending who is, what is their background. But the, the conceptually, you understand what uh, what we're doing. Here. So, calculate receiver sensitivity is a power. And what is the power? That's the power of the signal required for this receiver to work properly under given conditions. The part of that receiver sensitivity is the signal to noise requirement that comes from the type of the waveform that is being used. You know, whether it's and the and the detail rate or whatever is the quality of service threshold that you're trying to provide. And then the second part is the power of the noise. This part is given with the waveform, right? This part may change over the course of the day, depending on what kind of noise you have. And, uh, and usually we kind of mentioned that, uh, I guess, in, in uh, most situations, we take into account the worst case. Uh, you say the worst this temperature can be is this, and then you calculate what is the power of the signal that you need to provide here. Then moving up the chain, you can say what is the power here, what is the power here? Knowing what your ERP is, you can calculate maximum allowable path loss, and this becomes your your uh, budgeted path loss. And then you have to make sure that whatever is actually causing the path loss is smaller than what your what your budgeted path loss is. 
Any questions here? Okay, so that's what I uh, what I have uh, for today. Uh, next time we're going to look at both links and, and do some calculations, examples of the complete thing costs.